success uh, is accomplishment of goals, whatever goals you've set for yourself in life. If you can attain those goals, I'd call that success. Do you consider yourself to be a success? Yes. And why? Because I've attained most all the goals that I've ever started out to attain. Mr. Terry is, I would say, a man of noble character. Warm, friendly, uh, caring. A gentle giant is one that I would, would say both in physical stature and um, the success the gentleman had. Mr. Terry was larger than life. He was no nonsense, but he was still caring. He just had a, a warmth to him that was, I think, different than a lot of people expected. He was an imposing guy, um, definitely well over six feet. Tallish, he, he seemed 10 feet tall to me. <laughs> I mean, when you walk in a room, you saw Mr. Terry, you knew that that was the guy that, that owned the room. I think Howard Terry was Howard Terry. Definitely. And you could take it or leave it, but he was who he was. I think Mr. Terry was born with a backbone of steel. And I think he knew from a very young age that he was gonna go somewhere. And I think that uh, your attitude and your mind can power you a long way. And it definitely powered Mr. Terry. Howard Terry was born in 1916 in Cameron, Texas, which was a little town in Milam County, about halfway between Houston and Dallas. When Mr. Terry came out of high school, it was during the height of the Depression. His mom and pop operated a small convenience store and filling station, and Mr. Terry actually worked there in the summer some to help his family during these difficult times. We uh, had enough to eat. There's a lot of things we didn't have, but uh, at that time and place, it was during the Depression. And uh, I guess by today's standard, we were very poor, but we didn't really realize at that time that we were. His dad told him that if you graduate from high school, uh, I'm going to buy you a watch. So he worked hard, he studied hard, and he graduated from high school, and there was no money for the watch. So his dad got him a used watch, and it was a watch. He was thrilled with it, but it made it clear to him from a very early age that he wanted to leave Cameron. He wanted to go to college but, and get out of Cameron, but he really didn't have any way to do it and he was uh, shoveling gravel for the Texas Highway Department. I recall him telling me it was at 15 cents a cubic yard. 50, a cubic yard of gravel was a lot of gravel. His father thought it was a really great job because there weren't a lot of jobs out there, but Howard Terry knew that wasn't what he wanted to do. Mr. Terry had not been a particularly remarkable student, but one thing that he was really good at was football, and he hoped that that would be the ticket that would secure him a seat at one of the Texas public universities. His father told him that that was probably a bad idea. But Mr. Terry always laughed when he, he told that story and said, no, I wasn't gonna stay there. I knew I wanted to go somewhere else and do something different. And he found a way to make it happen. And then fate kind of stepped into the picture. Mr. Terry had a science teacher who really thought a lot of him and wanted to see him succeed. This man knew a guy who operated a sporting goods store across the street from the University of Texas. One thing led to another, and the man in Austin said he could get Mr. Terry an interview with a new coach if he could get to Austin. The science teacher decided that he would personally drive Mr. Terry because it was the only way he could get there to this interview that was gonna change his life. He went to Austin, interviewed for about 30 minutes, and the coach said that he could have a scholarship and come to the University of Texas as a football player. A 30-minute interview that changed Mr. Terry's life. When Howard Terry started his football career, he was a good player, but he wasn't a great player. He wasn't destined to be a starter at that point, but he worked incredibly hard. The coach actually took him aside after one of the practices and acknowledged that he was getting better and thought he would be really good. Mr. Terry laughed and said he would be even better if he didn't have to work two to three hours a day on the, uh, the jobs for his scholarship. And the coach laughed and said, all right, you don't have to do that anymore. And Mr. Terry said that's when he knew he'd arrived on the football scene. Huge crowds gather each fall to watch hard-fought, brilliant games between the University of Texas and leading teams of the Southwest and of the nation. 
In the senior year of Mr. Terry's uh, sojourn there at the University of Texas, uh, the University of Texas was having a very, very difficult year. They were losing more than they were winning, and as it turned out, they were set in November to play Baylor University. Baylor was number one in the country, and UT wasn't ranked. As it turned out, uh, Mr. Terry was going to be the manager and the uh, captain of the team that week that they played Baylor. That was not an honor that was a permanent season-long thing. It was rotated, particularly among the seniors, and it was Mr. Terry's turn for this award. Howard sat down with his coach and said, I've got some plans, some ideas about how we can win this game. And he said, Coach, there's some guys that hadn't been playing particularly well for you out there. He says, if I have a word with them, I think they can play better. I think we can get more out of them. And the coach said, well, go ahead. I'll start those guys if you can get them ready to play. I won't say he invented the blitz, but he thought of the idea about how he could basically blitz the quarterback. And he said he put that guy on his butt the whole game. It was a tight game until the very last minute. And UT kicked a field goal in the fourth quarter to win the game nine to six. It was a game that sent shockwaves around the nation. That was the first time that UT lit the tower in honor of a victory, an athletic victory. And that was very moving. That really meant a lot to him. After that game, there was a brand new award that was being given out at the time. It was called the Grantland Rice Award. Grantland Rice was a famous sportscaster of the day. And that award was uh, traditionally given on the most famous radio broadcast of the day, which was the Ripley's Believe It or Not show. And that week, they announced the team that had won the award was the University of Texas. And the captain of that team, the team that won that award, got a gold watch with his name on it. And Mr. Terry got that gold watch, and it was an important piece of memorabilia to him, along with the uh, game ball from that game. As Mr. Terry was getting out of college, war clouds were gathering in the east. On December 7th, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. I was with P&G in Oklahoma City when Pearl Harbor occurred. I applied for a commission in the Navy, and uh, that was awarded late that year in 42. He quickly decided that he was going to quit his job and join the war effort. And as part of that, you had to say why you were interested in joining the Navy. He thought his country needed men like him, and that's why he was going to do it. If you think about Mr. Terry's personality, if he's going to do something, he's going to be in charge of it. Without any experience as a naval officer, you can't be in charge of a battleship or an aircraft carrier, but he can be in charge of a PT boat. And so that's what he did. One of the reasons that Howard Terry was chosen to be a captain of a PT boat was because the size of a PT boat crew was roughly the same size as a football team. And in fact, the squadron that Mr. Terry joined over in the Pacific was called the All-American Squadron because there were so many football players that were serving as officers in that squadron. Mr. Terry used to play poker with all the officers. He had just an instinctive ability to calculate odds in his head. In fact, I heard from one of the guys that served with him that he basically cleaned out everybody in the officer's training school within about two weeks of arriving on the campus. And I remember one occasion when they were getting ready to leave for their next major posting, they had had this craps table made, it was really fancy, and then they needed to take it along with them. And so snuck it out in the middle of the night, covered it with a tarp. And the next day, as they were getting ready to leave, the uh, commander of the squadron went by and he said, what is that? Get that thing off the table and chop it up and throw it into the water. And Mr. Terry said it didn't take long before they regained the craps uh, ability in the next program. Mr. Terry and his PT boat were part of a force of about 30 PT boats that were guarding a strait called Surigao Strait. And it was in that service when he fought in the Battle of Leyte Gulf in October of 1944. Greatest amphibious force ever assembled in the Pacific. Leyte Island, midway between Luzon and Mindanao, is the target. In the middle of the night, Mr. Terry and his boat were guarding one of the entrances when this huge convoy of gigantic Japanese ships was heading toward them. Mr. Terry decided to uh, make the torpedo run against the Japanese ships. He said it was the scariest event in his life. That all you could see ahead of you, as far as you could see, was just a solid wall of fire. And there was no way that they could succeed. They were never intended to go against 
vessels that were hugely disproportionately armed and, and larger. And he had a friend of his that had come along with him. It was a supply officer, Jackson Hines. And Jackson had kind of begged to come along because he was a supply officer and had never been in combat. And uh, Mr. Terry had agreed and took him along on this mission. And as they were preparing for this uh, torpedo run, Mr. Terry turned to Jackson and said, Jackson, I'm sorry. And uh, Jackson said, why? He said, because I'm afraid I'm about to get you killed. And they made this torpedo run, released their torpedo. And as soon as he saw the torpedo go away, he said, you could see the gun start turning on him. So they turned as fast as they could and started making smoke to keep the enemy from being able to find them and the rest of the PT boats. Fortunately, those Japanese ships turned back and the United States managed to hold off this last ditch effort by the Japanese fleet. It was a very dangerous event and he always told me that it was probably the closest time he ever had in his entire life uh, to losing his life. After the Battle of Surigao Strait, it was becoming very clear that the Americans were going to win the naval battles in the Pacific, but they still had to enter Manila Bay and take the fortifications there in Manila. As it turned out, PT boats were going to go through past Corregidor and into Manila Bay, and they'd be the first United States forces into Manila Bay. And Mr. Terry was always proud that he was one of the very first American vessels uh, to come into Manila Bay and take back the Philippines. Mr. Terry knew that he had survived in the war when some other people had not been so successful. And I think that had an impact on his life. About two days following the Battle of Surigao Strait, Mr. Terry had to go out on a night mission. They went in and engaged the Japanese and got the boats kind of shot up and in trouble. They were kind of limping back to port in broad daylight. Suddenly, a Japanese dive bomber came through and bombed the boat right next to him. He said, you know, I'm not a religious man, but you kind of wonder, you know, when it's a 50-50 shot and it wasn't you on that occasion. And I, I always thought that, uh, you know, a, a number of people that were recipients of the scholarship program would, would tell you exactly why he wasn't the guy that was hit. But uh, he always wondered about that and, and uh, was, thought it was important. <laughs> At that time, the post-war boom was just taken off. And that really was just designed for a guy like Howard Terry. He wanted to do more than what his parents had done. He didn't want to live in small town Texas for the rest of his life. He wanted to have some things. People were building houses. The, the veterans could buy their houses cheaply. So he formed some real estate partnerships. And they were building houses and selling them to the servicemen. And he got into the appliance business, and he was selling stoves to uh, put into the houses that he was selling. Well, they were selling these ranges on the installment plan. Well, they got to have a lot of capital in order to make these stoves. So he went to New York and was able to negotiate a good loan. And that's how Mr. Terry learned, well, gosh, this is how you can capitalize your business and cause it to grow. And he said, man, this banking stuff is pretty good. So then he got in the banking business and created one of the biggest banks in the state of Texas, uh, Allied Bank and Trust. So he was doing real estate construction and banking, and then that kind of led into insurance. Because when you buy a house, you got to get insurance. And then you start to realize, if you do the math, and this is where Howard was really good. He could sit down and say, OK, well, I've got real estate, banking, mortgage, insurance. Where am I making the most money? And then he'd say, OK, well, I'm making the most money here. Forget that. Let's do this. He was good at that. I've had three mentors in my life. My father, uh, of course, was my first, and then uh, Walter Misher and Howard Terry. Walter Misher and Howard were business partners. We fit together very well. I uh, started doing joint ventures with him. And then we, our business got complicated enough that we just became general partners and pushed everything together and uh, into a partnership that uh, lasted for 20 years. First and foremost, uh, Mr. Terry was an investor. He really never ran any of his ventures that he was involved with. He invested in them and monitored who ran them. He was one of the first to see the true value in what are known as MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships. He also uh, did very, very well in the banking business. Uh, he did very, very well in manufacturing. He could turn $5 uh, into 5000 uh, without batting an eye. 
Penn Central, as you probably know, was the largest railroad in the United States at, at this time. The, the sad thing about the railroads back then, they were overregulated, they, they couldn't make any money. And Penn Central filed bankruptcy in 1970, I believe. And at the time, that was the largest bankruptcy in the history of the United States. As a consequence, they transferred all the assets to Conrail, which was a public corporation created by the United States, is owned by the government. Well, Howard and some other people had created Marathon Manufacturing Company. And Marathon was a Fortune 500 company. It was very profitable and making lots of money. So they decided to merge Marathon into Penn Central. So they did that. And Howard ended up being the largest single individual shareholder of Penn Central. Now the problem was that Penn Central coming out of bankruptcy had a chairman, CEO, Richard Dicker, who was a bankruptcy lawyer. He was not a businessman. He wanted to acquire Colt Industries, the manufacturer of firearms and all these other things. And he was buying Colt's earnings and paying more for it in terms of more shares than he should have. He was basically transferring wealth from Howard to Colt shareholders. And Howard just told him, he said, I, I, this is a bad idea, it's a bad deal, you shouldn't do it, and I'm gonna vote against it. And Dicker just told him, go sit down, we're gonna do it anyway. And Howard said, no, I don't believe you are. And he and Carl Lindner at American General Insurance, who was another big shareholder, uh, Herbert Hunt, who was another big shareholder of Penn Central, started the proxy fight. And long story short, they won, they defeated the deal. And at that time, it was one of the very, very few occasions when individual shareholders could oppose management and get them to stop doing a deal that was bad for shareholders when management, entrenched management, had already determined to do it. And this was an earthquake in the financial community and in Wall Street. It was a big deal at the time, it was huge. I met Mr. Terry because I was his personal lawyer and the lawyer for some of his companies. Mr. Terry was not entirely comfortable with the legal field, and he, he always made a number of comments to me about it that made it clear that he was, uh, he was no fan of lawyers in general, but he liked us in particular. Over the years, you know, I would take the occasion to ask him things and, because he's an interesting guy, and we got to be friends. Back then, they only had a two-person office. It was Howard and Beth. I worked for Mr. Terry for 30 years. He lived to work. He could turn dust to silver. <laughs> Howard Terry always had a, a reputation for being a tough businessman, and, and uh, there's no two ways about it. He was a tough businessman. He was a man of integrity, high morals, good ethics. He let you know what he thought of you. He was didn't mince words. I have heard of the terms barracuda and gorilla. When it came time to get tough with somebody, or somebody was acting up, they weren't doing right, or you had a customer that just says, I'm not gonna pay, I don't care what you do to me, they'd call Howard in. If someone did not honor their side of it, the Barracuda would definitely come out. <laughs> They're gonna get you. <laughs> <laughs> One event where I observed him take somebody to the woodshed, and I remember it like it happened yesterday. I come in, I sit down, he says, I'm getting ready to call this guy, and I want you to listen. So I just sat there while he got a guy on a speakerphone. And he talked to that guy for 20 minutes in ways that I hope never nobody ever talks to me. He didn't have to yell. He didn't have to yell. He wasn't really unpleasant. He was just forceful and factual. I had no doubt that he was not to be messed with. He was a serious individual, but if he let you in his inner circle, you knew how, what a caring individual he was. He was always uh, uh, stated to me to be a fairly gruff, uh, rough and tumble uh, man. When I met him, it was nothing like that. He was one of the most gracious human beings I've ever been around. Mr. Terry was very, very good to all of us. He was very fair, always very fair. He took such good um, care of us. Yeah, definitely always fair. He was tough, but you never saw a person that was more uh, protective of his partners and his business associates. In fact, one of his, his sayings was, in dealing with people in a business context, you need to leave a little ham on the bone so that everybody actually came out of it to they were better off, and that was his goal.
needless to say, it wasn't a straight line to victory. We had setbacks, and some big setbacks. I remember on one occasion when the market just took a decided plunge, and he had lost on paper a huge amount of money in that day. And at the end of the day, he kind of clapped me on the back and said, well, we'll just go back and get at him again tomorrow. He would come downstairs, and Ed would be, oh, this is what's going on. And Mr. Terry would say, oh, hell, it'll all balance out. We'll write it up, just, and we'll write yeah, it down. We'll write we'll it up, up, we'll write it down. Really, he made his big money in the bust of the 80s. Howard ended up owning a bunch of drill pipe that he couldn't sell. At one time, I think he owned more oil field tubular goods than anybody else in the U.S. And then he started figuring out, well, how do we make money doing this? How can I sell it, use it, turn it into cash? The next thing I know, Howard said, you know, I want you to do something for me. He says, we're gonna drill some wells and we're gonna do it with Halliburton providing the, the frack services and the pumping, the cement. Penrod's gonna provide the rigs and I'm gonna provide the tubulars. We're gonna go out and find people that have undrilled leases. And these guys had these leases all over the United States that they couldn't drill, they didn't have any money. Well, he had a lot of money and he could borrow very cheaply. So he worked out these deals where he would finance the drilling of the wells and finance the services that were necessary to get these wells drilled in exchange for a production payment out of the production from the wells that he was drilling. We drilled thousands of wells doing that all over the United States, hugely profitable. I don't think anybody ever really quantified how much money he made off of that. It was huge. He didn't get any thrill out of counting his money. What thrilled him was having the ability to have options, make decisions, and be able to do different things based upon the fact that he had the financial resources to be able to do it, just like the Terry Foundation. You know, he loved the Terry Foundation, but he couldn't have done that if he hadn't had a lot of money. Howard Terry taught me a lot about business and a lot about life. Uh, I was imp incredibly impressed with the fact that he was so personally uh, committed to helping other people. He came to see me and told me that he had decided he was going to create the Terry Foundation. We're going to give all of our money to this foundation to educate people. And I was just aghast. And I sat back in my chair and I said, well, Mr. Terry, I know about how much money you've got. Are you sure this is what you want to do? And he said, oh yeah. He said, we've, we've talked about it. This is, this is what Nancy and I want to do. And I said, wow, that's, that's an awesome thing. And, and if you want to do that, I would be thrilled to help you set it up and, and run it. He had called me one night, and I had only been working there like a year and a half. And he stopped by my office one of those Monday afternoons and said, uh, hey, son, could you stop by my house on the way home tonight from work? I said, oh, gosh, what have I done now? And uh, sure enough, I get to his home. And he said, well, I'd like to start a foundation to help young people help themselves. He said, I think I can change more lives by helping it at the people level. He wanted to do something personal uh, with his fortune. He did not want his name plastered on all sorts of uh, buildings, edifices, uh, statues, etc. That, that was not the man at all. Mr. Terry remembered that he would still be pumping gas in Cameron, Texas, if it weren't for uh, his scholarship to go to UT. And he knew that young people today needed an education, that it was really important for them to be able to succeed in life, and that it was really very difficult for those young people to get that education, to finance it uh, without a lot of debt, um, unless they had some help. He always told me that he was gonna take care of his kids, and then the rest of his money, after his kids were provided for, he wanted to help as many kids as he could. He said, look, I got my trusted lawyers gonna come on the board. I got my trusted tax number man coming on the board. I've got Daryl Royal, who knows how to read young people being a good football coach coming on the board. And I want somebody young that's not a family member that'll remember why I started this when I died. Are you interested? And I said, sure, I'll be happy to help you. And so that's how that started. The foundation was set up on paper in December of 1986, but we started with our first group of scholars in 1987 and wrote the first checks then. There were a total of 17 scholars at the two universities, UT and Texas A&M. We figured out early on through question and answers, well, Mr. Terry, what do you really mean here? You know, 
that the three criteria for getting a scholarship was academics, financial need, and leadership. And he was very big on leadership. I think Mr. Terry had had many experiences in his life where leadership had allowed him to make a difference on the football field during World War II and certainly in his professional life in many different business dealings. It was very important to Mr. Terry to do a face-to-face -face interview because he'd known through his own interactions with people that uh, seeing things on paper wasn't the same as seeing something in person. And he had known that there was no substitute for actually uh, shaking hands with people and getting to know them personally. In the beginning, the interview panel was just the trustees, Howard and Nancy, Coach Royal, uh, John Storms, Carter Overton, and me. I remember my parents driving me to Houston. It was probably the first time I had been in the city. Um, I'll never forget the interview, big oak table, and some very impressive and imposing people on the other side. I drove down to Houston for probably the first time in my life and walked into a room that included Mr. and Mrs. Terry, and uh, I looked across the room and noticed uh, Coach Darrell Royal from the Texas Longhorns was in there, and at that point in time, I knew something serious uh, was at hand. You know, I was, grew up a big fan of, uh, of UT sports, so I, I knew a little bit about Coach Royal. It's just amazing to think that you had, you know, Coach Royal there and Mr. Terry, and, you know, they're asking you questions about uh, what you're going to do with the rest of your life. It was very intimidating, but it was also in an environment that I could tell they wanted to know who I was and what my plans were. My mother recalled that when I came out of that interview, they asked how it went, and I said, the people were amazing. I could have talked to them all day long. Funny, I remember one kid that we were interviewing in Houston a couple of years ago, asked him if there's anything else that he'd like to ask us. He said, yes, sir. I said, what's that? He says, how in the world did you make all this money? <laughs> Howard wanted to look you in the eye and see into your heart, and you tell me, are you willing to work hard to succeed in life? And if you can convince me through what you have already done that you will really work hard to succeed, then I'll take a bet on you. He wasn't interested in someone that made all A's, which was surprising. He wanted someone that had that, that drive and that look in their eye, that hungry, he would use the word hungry, that hungry look that he had. Mrs. Terry brought a, a special dimension to the interviews. Uh, she had been in a kind of a nursing field at one point, so she was used to dealing with people and was really personally connected with the, the students. I probably noticed the biggest difference when I sat for two days on an interview panel and I got to see her and Mr. Terry interact with each other, and that's the first time that I ever heard her say, oh, poops, come on, let's, you know, let's give this one a shot. I learned later that some of the rules that we have in place, we have a very democratic process, and it's, it's been very consistent for the 30 years of the, the scholarship program, but one of the rules is that there's no lobbying. At the end of the day, there's six people, everybody has an equal vote, and you do that in secret. And I was told later that part of that rule was because Mrs. Terry would sit and really lobby for the ones that she liked. She looked for the right criteria. She would see a candidate come in, she would ask a few questions, and then when that candidate left, she'd say, I love that person, I just love that person. We have to give them a scholarship. I said, Mrs. Terry, we're not supposed to, you know, you, you gotta vote, we all, I know, but we gotta give that person a scholarship. Just have to. If you don't give him a scholarship, her a scholarship, then I'm gonna give him a scholarship. And she, you know, that made clear that she felt pretty strong about that. And usually everybody would vote for that person. Usually they were pretty qualified anyway. Mrs. Terry um, had an affection for the arts. She loved photography and painting. And so I think a lot of her affinity for that sort of probably contributed to the well-roundedness and the diversity of our scholarship program because we don't have just doctors or just lawyers or just engineers. We have teachers and we have artists and we have music performance majors. We selected 17. We had 17 the first year and then it grew after that over time. 
I was one of the first Terry Scholars at Texas A&M in 1987. From the very beginning, Mr. Terry always talked about he wanted this program to be more than a check in the mail. And part of that was his expectation that he would try to get to know the scholars by having events where he could interact with them. And he took those very seriously. He really was investing in people that he had handpicked. This one is dated March of 1991, and it was the annual invitation to Winedale for the picnic. He says, this will be our first meeting of all four classes, and we will honor our graduating seniors. It's a very informal occasion, but we consider this our most important function of the year because it's our only opportunity to all be together. We certainly expect 100% attendance, so no goof-ups are acceptable. Sincerely yours, Howard Terry. The picnic, we took uh, touring buses to get there. Uh, we all would sit at a couple of few picnic tables under a tree, and I don't even think Mr. Terry needed a microphone to address the group. At those early functions, he had interviewed every student. When you talked to him, you felt like you were the most important person in the room. He always cared about others. He didn't come in and start talking about himself. He always asked about you know, as a student, he asked about me, how I was doing. He always wanted to know what you were doing, and you wanted to make sure that you were going to tell him that you were accomplishing your goals, that you were using his gifts to make the world a better place. Miss Terry was a very warm and outgoing person. Uh, whenever we saw her at a function, she would always be herding students together so she could take photos of them. Mrs. Terry was legendary for her camera and many of the pictures that we have from the early days of the foundation, we have her to thank for. Nancy and Mr. T were always in the thick of the kids. And of course, he would always address uh, the kids about the significance of the foundation and what they, were, what they were being handed. The spring picnic sort of evolved into the recognition of the graduating seniors. Mr. Terry said, hey, you graduating seniors, why don't you tell us what you're gonna do? And so we literally just stood up wherever we were sitting and said, you know, I'm Yvonne, I'm graduating with a degree in mechanical engineering, I've got a job at Chevron, moving to Houston, I'm getting married. And each person had the opportunity to do that. And I think at that point, he realized this investment has paid off. Look, look what's happened to these students and the things that they've been able to accomplish. And so then every year that became the tradition. We knew that from time to time, a student that we, we took in the scholarship program would have difficulties. After all, we'd chosen people because many of them came from uh, home situations were very challenging to the, the best of them. I was fortunate to be one that followed the rules and never really got in trouble, but I definitely knew that there were scholars that saw the tough side of him. You didn't want Mr. Terry to call you and give you the Dutch uncle speech that you had messed up. He would actually call up uh, a scholar and say, you know, why, what, what's going on here? I said, you know, I've looked at your application. I know how smart you are. I know that what you did in high school or community college. And, you know, this is not typical of the kind of work that you can do, and you can do better than this. So what's the problem? I, for one, as a Terry Scholar, had my own struggles in the maturation process. And I think that the Terry Foundation does a terrific job of recognizing that 18, 19, 20-year-old students are not perfect and does a good job of fostering that family concept and keeping them in the fold. Mr. Terry was always about trying to find a way, if we could, uh, to get them back in school and get them back on the uh, more successful path because he used to say, we didn't take anybody in here to bust them out. We took them in here to help them. And if there's a way to help those people, let's find a way to do it. Gradually over time, the amount of his assets grew and grew and grew, and we could see that this program was gonna be much bigger than we'd ever anticipated. And so we started trying to figure out proactively some things we could do to spend this money wisely and to really have the kind of impact throughout the state that this program was intended to have. And so the first step out in 2004 was at Texas State and at University of Houston. The more he got to know those scholars at the other schools, he realized that those students had just as much to offer. And so we added another four schools in very short order. And as we could see more and more money coming to the foundation, 
We gradually expanded the program and ended up with the large number of schools we have now. And he always loved those, those other programs and told me on many occasions that one of the best, best decisions we ever made was expanding the program to the other schools. He really appreciated being able to call us by name. And he would remember little things about each person. So certainly as we expanded to other schools and as the numbers got bigger, he wasn't involved in the interview process for every student. He didn't necessarily know their name, but to counteract that, he also saw how many different individuals he was helping. He wouldn't look at the statistics. He would meet the people. He, he was very much, you know, tell me about what this person's done. Tell me about this person. What have they done? Where have they come from? What did they do? He knew it was gonna be huge when he was gone. And he because was happy that he wasn't gonna have to be the one and he was here dealing with it. And he was thrilled that he would he would not be the one here dealing with it. <laughs> the picnic all of a sudden got so big that the scholars couldn't find the staff. So we decided to get white shirts with the Terry logo so we would be easy to spot in a crowd. We didn't have a logo at that point, so we hired some artists and, and got the logo and printed, printed some shirts. And then we thought they were so nice, we thought, well, let's get them for the board of directors. And he just scoffed at wearing his own name on his chest. He wasn't about to do something like that. He just seemed surprised that everybody wanted um, the Terry Foundation uh, logo to wear it around everywhere. I don't recall Mr. Terry wearing a logo shirt, ever. Everybody knew who Mr. Terry was. <laughs> Late in his life, we were talking about a function we'd been to that involved a whole lot of Terry scholars. And he said, you know, Ed, said something funny happened. Well, I was talking to some of them and, and I noticed they were all, all referring to themselves as Terry's. It's just like they were a member of my family. I said, that's exactly the way they feel. And he thought about it for a minute. He says, you know, that's exactly the way we wanted it towards the end. When Mr. Terry and Mrs. Terry would show up, they would bring him in on a golf cart, and he would come up, and of course, people would just swarm. They just were like crowded around him. They all wanted to be there to shake their hand. Like a rock star um, showed up. And tell them thank you, yes, definitely. Mr. Terry was a firm believer in a firm handshake, and if someone had a weak, limpy handshake, it bothered him, and he would tell you and so here he goes, probably who knows how many scholars he told to firm up their handshake. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're breaking his hand. Everyone that came across there would shake his hand and shake his hand and it just tore his hand up. He would wear a brace to protect him, but he would not stop shaking their hands. He was going to shake their hands. Mr. Terry and Mrs. Terry too, for that matter, used to say that the, the most enjoyable thing that they did is, uh, with the foundation was go to the picnics and listen to the graduating seniors give their speech. It's a very moving event. It's the most uplifting thing that we do. I'm normally very good at knowing what to say. Now that I get up here, my heart is so full that I really don't, the words aren't coming. I want to thank the foundation for the blessing you with the opportunity to finally complete this 10-year journey. I'm a former foster youth and I'll be graduating with my bachelor's degree in social work and I'm so excited. I just needed someone to give me a chance, and the foundation gave me a chance. So thank you to the foundation and my new Terry family. You've been here for me, and I will be there for you. Thank you. Over the years, we experimented with a variety of different things to give to our graduating seniors because we wanted something that would help them remember the program and to keep in touch with us. And we gradually settled into one that was very important, and that was a gold pen. During one of the key business deals that he had that managed to create the resources to help endow the Terry Foundation, uh, they'd had a closing for that particular deal. At the closing, each of the participants got a gold pen to remember it by. He treasured it. He had it on his desk, he carried it in his pocket, and it went everywhere he went. And it meant so much to him that when it came down to it, he thought, well, if, you know, the way this pen means so much to me, maybe if we give them a pen that says the Terry Foundation, they'll keep it with them like I've kept my pen with me. Mr. Terry was a very humble man. Uh, it was undeniable that he did not want personal recognition. Mr. Terry never wanted his name on a building or anything like that. 
And so when the U of H scholars, as their senior gift, gave a, a fairly large portrait that looks like a portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Terry, the staff loved it and they really wanted to hang it in the office. And he said, there's, you know, I, I don't need a picture of myself. At first, he didn't want that picture up. He said, no, we're not gonna put that up. And Beth insisted, no, we are going to put that picture up. And he finally relented and said, okay, we can put the picture up, but it was a big deal. Yeah, but I think he realized, you know, how important it was to the students sure. that they had done that for him. The picture itself is a collage of scholar activities throughout the year. And I think Beth had to convince him that it wasn't necessarily a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Terry, but it was a picture that represented what they had done and the many different lives that they had touched. Howard Terry never changed his uh, mode of operations about business. He enjoyed being at the office and he would come in every day, even some days when he didn't have to. I'd see him up here on a Saturday or Sunday if there was something that needed doing. It's all been fun. Heck, I'm uh, 84 years old and I'm still working, so I guess I must like it. I usually did not get into the office till 9.30, and always I'd be like, if once I could just get there before Mr. Terry got there, because he, his car was always parked in its spot every day when I got here. You could set your watch by Mr. Terry. He was a very scheduled person. And every day at 3.15, the front door downstairs would open. Mr. Terry would come in and say hi to everybody down the hall and go into Ed Cottom's office. And they, it was 15 minutes after the market closed and they would discuss the activity of the market that day and how it affected the endowment. If he was in town, he was at work. And if he did not feel well, he would come in and lay on the sofa. He had a sofa in his office, but he had a routine and he stuck with it. Yeah. Mr. Terry was here, as always, during interviews, come in, sit, the kids would go, wait, that was Mr. Terry, he's gonna be in my interview? And you're like, yes, he still does this. One time, um, we were at a U of H event we were actually at orientation, and normally Mr. Terry and Miss Terry didn't come for those events. And so he walks in and we're like, Mr. Terry, what are you, you what, you're not supposed to be here. He goes, well, you know, y'all have all been working so hard this all week getting ready for this event, and I just felt bad. I felt bad, I needed to be there too. Y'all were working, so I'm here. And I mean, the students were just like, they couldn't believe it. On that Thursday, I came in, he was here, and before I left, you know, I told him bye, um, just like I always did. And the next morning, I got here, and he wasn't here. And I came upstairs, and, um, you know, that's when Jamie said that he had um, taken ill. Being 95 years old, you know that eventually something's going to happen. But we'd just seen him the day before, so it was really hard to come in and see that he wasn't there. We were scheduled to have a call with one of the universities about our scholars and setting their scholarships. And in the middle of the call, we, we got a message that uh, we needed to come out right away and learn that he had passed away. It was one of the saddest days of my life, frankly. What surprised me was how it hit me because he was like a silent partner. He was always there. He wasn't, you know, in the everyday operations of the foundation, but he was always there. And when all of a sudden he was gone, I was surprised that I had never thought that far ahead of what, how it was gonna feel. It was different from the time, from the day he passed. It was different. The day of Howard Terry's memorial was probably one of the most emotional days of my life because I was going to be the person that had been chosen to really sum up his life and, and uh, give the eulogy. And I, I'd written it up and practiced it a number of times, but I frankly was not sure I was going to be able to get through it because many times in practicing it, I'd, I'd actually broken down in the midst of it and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it. We showed up there at the country club and I wasn't sure what kind of crowd we'd had. I knew we'd have some people, but I wasn't sure how many people were there and went into that ballroom and it was practically filled with people. And I said, what in the world? Where, where did all these people come from? I mean, that was a huge ballroom and it was packed with people. And Terry Scholars came in. There was one girl that came up to me that flew in from California for the funeral. She said, I know nobody's gonna know me and Mr. Terry wouldn't know me, but I knew him, he changed my life. 
And there were two or three incoming students three. who had not mm -hmm. begun their scholarship. They had just been notified that they'd been awarded and, and they came to the service. Really nice. They wanted to pay their last respects. I mean, my, my gosh, they, he had given them so much. Um, and there was no way that they could repay him. They felt like that that's what they needed to do. Yvonne and I got, got through our little parts in the, in the program, and I was, I was proud of how we did it. But it's, it's really hard to do justice to a man who's had the kind of life that he led and had the kind of legacy that he had. We had a picnic scheduled just shortly after he passed away, and it was, we knew that was going to be a very, very sad experience for uh, you know, not only the current scholars, but all of us that had knew him and had loved him over the years. And we, we had to make the best of it, but there was obviously a, a missing person in that chair that made it a different experience. I remember it striking me how personal his loss was for the scholars, yes. many of whom had not spoken to him at all, potentially. And if they had, it had been a couple of words exchanged, you know, maybe four years passed, but it was still a very personal loss for, for so many of them. There was a lot of crying at that picnic. I mean, they were very happy. The seniors were happy to be able to give their speech. But then on the other hand, they were very sad that they weren't going to be able to shake Mr. Terry's hand. I think it was U of H um, played the violin and it was the, it was just a time that everyone was quiet and it just, you could feel it. It was very, very moving. I, there was not a dry eye in the house. And I think every scholar group at every university had their own ceremony that they did on their own. I remember coming back from the picnic and all of the very thoughtful cards. I mean, we could have covered this table with the, the amount of sincerely written and very warm, grieving students who had written some very kind words about him. Not long after Mr. Terry was gone, in order to maybe give a feeling to the new scholars coming in uh, to get to know Mr. Terry, we turned his office into, I hate to use the word museum because it's not a museum, but it's full of memorabilia of Mr. Terry's life. And his chair from his desk is still up there, which he purchased in 1971 or 72. And the scholars will come in and have a seat. It's worn on the edges, and to me, that symbolizes his humbleness. He could have surrounded himself with opulence, but it was a perfectly good chair, and he liked it, and so he kept it, and so we kept it. Mr. Terry did not need anybody to congratulate him or make him feel good or pump him up. He made some comments to me about he hoped that, you know, nobody would forget him, and I was like, there is no way anybody will ever forget you. Mrs. Terry passed away very shortly after Mr. Terry, and so we lost both of them with us the same year, which was a, a difficult thing for us. Everyone had to step up at that point. It was just a very unsure time, but with this group, we all just had it. Oh, it's absolutely a family. Definitely. Definitely. And I think that started at the top. He knew that there was going to come a time when the foundation was going to change dramatically. It had to. He knew that. And he used to just shake his head and he'd say, I'm glad I'm not going to be here for that. Because he said, this is, I don't know how you guys are going to do this. It's, it's going to be a lot of change. At that time, about a third of Mr. Terry's assets were in the endowment for the foundation, but everything in his will was eventually going to go into the endowment. And so that meant that the foundation was going to have to grow tremendously. You, you have to also understand that our foundation is not, we give scholarships, it's not just a check in the mail, it's a program. It, it's not just a matter of saying, okay, we'll send me another 50 names and we'll send them another 50 checks. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way. So we had to have some staff to make it work. Ed and I were sitting down talking, and he said, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is retire, and the second thing we're going to do is call Yvonne Moody, because we need her to be the executive director of our program. I definitely was honored. I remember saying to Rhett, are you sure I can do this job? Because I didn't have, number one, any nonprofit experience. I wasn't exactly sure what it was going to entail. And I can remember Rhett telling me that they knew that Mr. Terry wanted someone that was passionate about the program. Mr. Terry knew that this program was going to long outlive 
he and his wife, and he set up the program with that in mind. From the very beginning, he decided to set it up so that the trustees and board of directors was going to include students that had uh, graduated from the program. And eventually, we changed the bylaws to where that all of the members of the board of directors were going to be former students. He always believed that the program wasn't just about him. It was about the opportunity and keeping the students engaged with each other and teaching them the lesson that he had gotten by giving somebody a hand up and, and making sure that they honored that spirit and continued the opportunity. And I think he would be proud of the program, the way it's evolved and how it's going to perpetuate after him with the students helping each other. I mean, he wanted to help as many people as he could, and that's what he did. And I'm sure he's smiling up there. When you leave here today, I want you to know that we care about each one of you individually because that's what Mr. Terry does. I think the opportunity to watch Mr. Terry and hear him speak and just hear his voice, it helps you remember that it's not just this random name, there's a life and a vision and a true story behind it. Life's not a one-way street. We've sent you through college. Now you think about what you're going to do for the next chapter. What's the most important thing you've ever done in your life? The Terry Foundation is the most important thing I've ever done in my life, simply because it's enabled me to help more people than I could have ever done otherwise. As the foundation continues to grow larger and the reach continues to grow further, it's important that each of us as Terry alums recognizes that that future success is dependent on our efforts. I mean, Mr. Terry, through his efforts, put all of us through school debt-free, and the least that we can do is give back our own time and energy to help the next generation. Mr. Terry never wanted us to forget where we came from, and it was always his expectation that you would pay it forward that if you were helped through this opportunity, that you ensure that you help someone else somewhere down the road. I'm making a commitment to you that I will champion the rest of my life to make you guys proud and understand that um, I'm going to give you back that return on investment, sir. This great man gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. He's given so many other people the opportunity of a lifetime. I, I wish I could have met him, but his legacy lives on through me that I can pass on to others. And everyone that I meet, I'm always telling them about Howard Terry, Nancy Terry, who they are and what they represent. It's just incredible if you, if you think about what the foundation has done uh, through you know, Mr. and Mrs. Terry's uh, generosity. Why would you not want to be a part of that? Mr. Terry left some really big shoes to fill, and I'm honored that I get to fill a little, a little part of those, those big shoes. When you make that personal connection, then I feel like I'm doing something that Mr. Terry would do. He was a warm man and, and a caring man and a man that inspired, and that's something that I, wa I want to carry forth. I would say the life I live gives back to the Terry Foundation. Every time I volunteer, I think of the Terry's. Every time I take care of patients, I think of the Terry's. I think of the Terry's all the time because they made my life what it is today. That's part of what being a Terry is all about. We spend the rest of our lives giving back so that we can make a difference. And if you just think of how many of us that there are out there, that's a lot of difference that we can make in the world. None of us would be here without them, and we want to make sure that for generations to come that people will still know who Howard and Nancy Terry were and why they started this educational foundation and what they hope to accomplish by helping students help themselves.